today we will be covering uh, step three, yes, of the ethical AI framework. So it's uh, what is the value uh, of data that you've got? How can it be collated? And uh, we will be going through this with uh, Dr. Mutlu Kukurova, who is a lecturer and a assistant professor, is that right, Mutlu, at, uh, on digital technologies at uh, UCL's Institute of Education. And uh, with him today, again, is uh, Kareem George, uh, who is an experienced uh, primary education head teacher and uh, Mutlu and Green will uh, be having a sort of a question and answer session with themselves just going over their own experiences and uh, there'll be opportunities for us to um, uh, have a chat over some questions if anybody has any questions uh, that they want to address uh, for the speakers please type them in the chat and we'll pause it at various intervals and I can read them out uh, to everybody so um, I'm just letting the last few people Mutlu's got his screen shared um, when you are ready Mutlu please take it away and uh, and uh, introduce us to step three of the ethical AI framework brilliant uh, thank you thank you very much Roland and uh, Thank you for, to everyone who has joined us today. Um, welcome to our AI Business webinar. Uh, thank you again for joining me. Um, as Roland briefly mentioned, today I will be talking about the step three of the ethical AI framework uh, with a focus on educators. Um, this is the step where we are thinking about identifying and collating relevant data for our AI solutions. In our last webinar, we explored some of the potential challenges uh, that our education organizations might have. And this week, we will cover what type of data we might have access to and how we can collate it to be able to potentially address some of these challenges with the help of AI solutions. So to that end, I'm going to explore the types of data that are relevant to educational institutions today and the differences between some of the commonly used data types. I will discuss the value and challenges of using multiple modalities of data. And as always, I will discuss the, uh, 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 and, and, and prompt you to, to look at yourself and, and your school, your educational organization, your teaching institution through a data and AI lens so that you can start developing an AI mindset as well. Please note that this is not a research webinar, and I really wanted to emphasize this from the very beginning. Um, it is specifically designed for educators to open up opportunities for discussions with them. We know from our experience and the available evidence on the design and use of AI solutions in educational organizations, that the uptake of AI in education is as much a social process as it is a technical one. So broad adoption of AI in educational organizations depends on teachers' trust AI outputs through their better understanding of how AI actually works, their assessment of AI's perceived value to address educational challenges, and AI's or AI solutions' overall reliability in the solutions that they provide. In the webinar, as Roland briefly mentioned, I will use um, uh, recent data examples from educational research to be able to potentially contextualize uh, the content that will be presented. Um, and I will be focusing both more on the traditional data collection uh, approaches and data resources, as well as innovative ways of using data to help us understand and eventually improve uh, educational outcomes. I will be joined by lovely Karin George, who is an experienced primary school teacher and advisor to discuss her perspective as an educator on some of the issues covered in this webinar. Who are we? I refer to we frequently, and this is the team for those of who are joining the webinars regularly might be now more familiar. We are Rose Luckin, uh, Carmel Kent, Benedict Dubillet, Mohammed Ali Shadri, Anissa Moeini, and myself, Mutu Kukurova. All of us have background in learning sciences, AI in education, and data science. In our work, we follow seven steps to AI readiness uh, using the ethical AI framework. This is an iterative step-by-step -step guide to prepare educators in their educational organizations 
to leverage the power of AI techniques to potentially address some of the challenges, problems that they are having in their everyday life. And the webinars are following the framework um, step by step. We already covered in our two uh, previous webinars. Um, they were about building enthusiasm and interest in um, AI readiness within an organizational uh, setting, educational organization setting, and the identification of particular challenges that you might want to solve with the help of AI. Further details of these, as well as many other potential useful resources for educators can be also found on our website on educateventures.com. So let's get on with the third step, which is on identifying and collating data for our AI solutions in educational organizations. So we discussed about the importance of identifying the particular challenge we need to focus in order to effectively design and use AI solutions to our problems. This is the case for all educational technology solutions, but particularly the case for AI, uh, which is driven by data usually. So for the sake of being specific in our discussion and the continuation of the process from the previous weeks, let us focus on the problem we have identified in the last webinar, which was how do we ensure the quality of teaching and learning in educational organizations? We have gone through 10 criteria to establish that, and we know that the problem is AI compatible, in essence, uh, which means that we know AI can provide some solutions to this problem. We already know enough about the problem to get started. We can know more about the problem and potential solutions if we do not know about it now through further uh, investigations. The context is not very controllable and there are many uncertainties about the problem at hand currently. We probably have some data already collected and can collect more if needed. We are not sure about the accuracy of the measures with regards to this problem usually because of the challenges and the complexities of the construct involved in the problem. We don't necessarily know always if the institution has an appetite to change, but we know for sure that ensuring teaching and learning quality in our educational organizations is considered as crucial in most spaces. Now, thinking about today, we need to particularly ask the key questions about how much data do we already have and can we collect more data if needed? Continuing along the, these key questions, in order to be able to potentially understand what data do we need to collect for the problem at hand, our usual first point of reference is the existing research, existing understanding and knowledge in the literature with regards to the problem. And in this case, we are thinking about quality of teaching and learning. Luckily, in the learning sciences literature, there is a vast amount of studies with regards to, to ensuring and improving the quality of teaching and learning. For instance, we know from the existing work that teaching and learning outcomes are the result of interactions between intra-individual factors, such as prior knowledge, emotions, motivations, as well as the contextual factors in which the learners and teachers perform. So we need to identify sources of data that would help us interpret those constructs. This often requires us to collect new data from our educational organizations, as it is rarely the case that in an educational organization, all the relevant data is systematically collected and available on those factors that we know have been studied and shown to be impactful on the quality of teaching and learning. In addition to these, new data uh, uh, sources can be identified looking at what is available in our organization, such as the data sources that relate to uh, the, the ensuring teaching and learning quality, 
that doesn't necessarily uh, answer the perhaps immediate uh, key questions that we are addressing, but can be potentially used to complement and triangulate, as well as can be used as a proxy to the data that we know we need to collect to address the challenge of ensuring teaching and learning quality. Now, at this stage, perhaps more specific to educational research or perhaps social sciences uh, in general, it is important to note the difference between what is observed and what we want to infer or predict. For instance, with regards to the specific challenge of ensuring the teaching and learning quality, most of the factors I have not mentioned as significant factors to achieve ensuring good quality teaching and learning relate to emotions, cognition, beliefs, or motivation of teachers and learners. These are not usually directly observable constructs, so we can't collect data from these constructs directly. Instead, what we do is to collect data from observable factors such as the learner and teacher behaviors and the contextual factors to be able to potentially infer and predict these significant constructs that we are interested in. So the data about this observability line allows us to interpret constructs about teaching and learning that are in the hypothesis space. These constructs very frequently require human input and annotation for inference and interpretations initially. However, later on, they can be predicted automatically with the help of AI. This is a significant point that we all need to be aware of while thinking about what data to collate from our educational organizations. That very frequently, what we are collecting data from is just a proxy of what we actually intend to understand and support in education. So more specifically thinking about the existing data sources you might have in your school, perhaps it is valuable to start thinking about these potential options as data collection points. You might collect data from people, from the physical environment, from the virtual environment, such as learning platforms, from learning management systems, administrative systems. You can collect data from curriculum, trying to identify connections between the topics, the subjects, to think about the potential domain model, uh, as we call in AI in education, to think about the potential pedagogical approaches, the resources that you might have and the people are using, as well as the connections between these resources and the re resources and the people. Equally importantly, you have to start thinking about the accessibility and usability of what data you already have. How the data was collected? Who owns it anyway? Is it ethical and consensual? Who has the responsibility for this data? Where is this data stored and how is it structured? What type of data is it and of what period do you have the data from? A potential example of data could be about a particular course information that was collected from teachers and learners with their consent that the education organization has the ownership of the data. It could be stored on a central institutional database and stored safely. The course administrator or the course tutor or learners themselves maybe uh, own this uh, particular piece of data. And the course admi administrator or the data uh, person who is responsible uh, in your school, if there is a, a, a one, can be responsible from the storage and safety of this data. It might involve textual descriptions of subjects and learning goals, means of assessment, teaching methods and resources, as well as the numerical data about past student performance, highlighting the areas of common difficulty from the last, say, let's say, five years. In addition to these, in terms of the new data, there might be various opportunities for data collection. There can be new digital platforms that can be implemented to do further log data collection, which is currently still the most frequently used data source for AI solutions in educational organizations. There can be video data from which, um, uh, can, as can be seen in these images, gesture, posture, motion, or face features can be detected and interpreted. 
There can be audio data from which further affected features can be identified. There could also be physiological data, EEG data, gaze data, and as well as more traditional observational and survey data to generate insights into the quality of teaching and learning in an educational organization. Then the next question to think about is how do you translate these data sources to a language that computers can understand and process? They don't necessarily understand, but they can process. So some of the common data types frequently used in computational processing are numeric data, such as whole numbers. They can be decimals, they can be real numbers. These can be sequences of data, such as lists, strings. They can be dictionaries that allow key and value parts uh, to all process together. It's, it can be sets in which there is no particular order of the elements. They can be Boolean, which are binary sources of data, uh, such as yes or no, or um, um, yeah, and or no. And it's not necessarily in the scope of this webinar, but it's important to highlight that before a computer can process such data from the educational organizations that we collect, there is a lot of pre-processing that has to happen. For instance, you need to filter and select appropriate data, deal with the missing values, duplicates of data, extreme values to be able to identify if there are outliers or not. You might concatenate, uh, concatenate or transform your data. You can group or aggregate some of the parts of your data and you usually need to normalize in order to be able to ensure different sources of data can be processed together and you need to deal with the imbalanced data labels in your in your data. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, very quickly, before I leave the floor for questions, I would like to talk about the value of multimodal data for educational organizations. In AI solutions, of educational organizations, there is a lot to be gained when solutions leverage various modalities of data rather than solely depending on the digital sources or more traditional log data or survey data. This is mainly because in an educational organization, social reality is the main subject. As I mentioned already, the constructs that we are interested in are multidimensional, complex processes that involve a combination of skills, knowledge, abilities. They are not necessarily static, they require temporal investigations because they change over time. They are also highly contextual and frequently challenges and solutions in one organization that we have identified with AI solutions hardly can be generalized to different uh, contexts. So, Usually, in order to be able to at least address some of these complexities in our AI solutions, multimodal data can help us build high-performing AI solutions compared to unimodal data. This issue is frequently known as a streetlight effect. Just as in the analogy of a drunken man trying to find his keys under the bright lights of a street lamp, even though he knows that he lost his keys in the car park, Single modalities of data that might come from um, only log or surveys might not be enough for us to be able to interpret and address complex educational challenges. Having said that, about the value of multimodal data for AI solutions, because they might improve the performance of our educational uh, 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 solutions with AI, it is important to note that the identification and collating of data in AI solutions is a balancing act rather than always going for more modalities of data and further uh, contextually relevant information. As discussed, there is value in striving for contextualized multimodal data. However, this often leads to more complex data analysis approaches and more sophisticated AI approaches to achieve high performance. This essentially means that these approaches that are highly non-transparent and very hard to interpret will need to be used, which in turn has an impact on the understanding and adoption of these AI solutions by the teachers and learners. Similarly, new data modalities can provide great insights into the processes, but they also bring in various ethical and practical issues alongside them 
which should be also taken into account. In essence, there is something to be gained and something to be lost in each decision that we make with regards to identifying and collating data with our AI solutions in education organizations. The question is often whether what we are gaining can potentially justify what is lost. And these kind of judgments should be made in an alignment with the values of the teachers, of the learners, of the people who, from whom we are collecting the data. Therefore, although this webinar is very, very simplified, an oversimplified version of the typical thinking that we go through while we are making decisions about what data to use and collate for our AI solutions in educational organizations, it is important to highlight here that weighing up the benefits and challenges of different data sources to be used in our AI solutions is a very significant step of our AI solutions in educational organizations. Okay, I am only aware of the time that I spent about 26 minutes and I would like to stop here. I know it's very hard to co concentrate uh, in this webinar in an online setting and allow people to ask any questions and invite any questions from the audience. So, Roland. Uh, hi, Molly. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we haven't uh, just at the moment got any questions in, in the chat, but um, I think Molly, um, sometimes uh, this happens with those. So I think perhaps if we continue uh, or you go to the next section, then any questions that do arise from, from that information, we can, we can um, you know, can be typed in then and we can answer them at the end. So I think if, if you just proceed as, as normal, then we'll just carry on. Brilliant. It's fine with me. Absolutely. Um, it's not easy to process information and, and uh, come up with questions always. <laughs> so today I am very privileged to be joined by Karin George uh, to discuss the implications of this step three about our ethical framework for educators. Karin, many thanks for joining me today. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to have you as an experienced um, uh, uh, school leader. Um, I would like to start by asking you, which might potentially help our audience to also think about in their own context. If we are to start thinking about designing an AI solution in a school, that, let's say aims to address the teaching um, and, and learning quality and ensuring that the quality is high. Typically, what kind of data sources would you have access to and how would you collect them? Okay, so let's have a look at the data sources and talk about the broad categories towards teaching and learning. So first of all, we've got the learners. So we would have information about their attendance records, even exclusions behaviour, which is important because it's talking about engagement and well-being before they start. Um, we've got teacher assessments so that you'd have the assessments and tests that they take. So that could range from SATs, QCA, GCSEs, you know, NFER, a whole range of tests. Um, then we've got progress from different baselines, from different key stages that, that they've started to see what to track their um, progress in their teaching uh, and, and in their learning. And then there's pupil surveys. Often we ask the pupils about their learning and how they think um, and how they're feeling about uh, the lessons and the learning and the styles of pedagogy that they're involved in. We'd also have um, in some schools, there'll be technology, uh, different technologies that might catch them like video enabled platforms to reflect on mm. how um, students approach learning. So that's, that's one set of data we would have that we could look at for the quality of teaching and learning. Then there's the staff and I'm talking about the wider staff and parents because it's, you know, you have to look at the effectiveness of the people that you employ in the roles that they have. And that might come from the performance reviews and the data that you collect via, if it's teachers, the moderation of their work, looking between schools at the quality of teaching and learning and, and where one teacher's performance might sit in their skills and their abilities. Mm -hmm. Um, you'd have teachers moderation of work across schools, book moderation, and obviously the results from their um, tests and assessments. You'd have also from performance reviews and your observations of teachers, you would understand the teacher's subject knowledge, the, the areas of strength and areas of development that mm. they might have in the professional. Um, and when you're developing their professional capital, they will also take part in telling you what they need and where they think they would like more work or where they could share their expertise. And then there's an important part in the groupings that you have in terms of the support staff you have and their skills and expertise and how they work alongside the teacher. 
And then the one area that we mustn't miss out is um, in terms of uh, uh, that group is the, is the parents, because parents' mm. um, surveys and feedbacks on how they view the teaching and learning and the pedagogical approach in the school and your engagement with the parents and how they support that learning all plays an important part in the quality of teaching and learning. Then there's the, so, so that's the learners and then that's the, the, the adult, the human body. Then there's the external data. Your schools are saturated in data with external reports from the local authority, from Ofsted on the quality of teaching and learning, from advisors and experts in areas that you've brought them in or that they've come in to assess and to see how the school's doing um, for special educational needs. And then you've got things like, you know, how well is a school looking at this might sound random, but, you know, the health and safety of those students generally. Mm -hmm. And then you've got financial audits so that, you know, the processes that you're putting for the quality and teaching of teaching and learning, is that having an impact for the financial spending and the awarding bodies that will come in as well, such, such as the Arts Mark Quality Mark, um, uh, you know, um, Sports Mark that might be looking at specific areas. So that's the external uh, data that you might have and then the two other um, categories is the environmental data you know what is the accommodation that the teaching link because that has an effect on how you teach mm. and learn and the resources that you have available to you from the smallest manipulatives that you might be using for maths to perhaps the technology that's available and you know what's the quality of your infrastructure like to support the technology that you're asking students and teachers to use which has an will have an impact on what's being tried you know trying to deliver and then finally, mm -hmm. and very importantly, is the curriculum, is the, is the subject areas and your pedagogical approach mm -hmm. to teaching and learning. So there's a huge array of data that schools will have. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really sounds brilliant. And as a matter of fact, um, it looks like um, a school is quite a, um, you know, potentially data um, source wise rich environment. And um, I would like to further ask you if you would like to potentially collect uh, any additional data on top of what you, uh, you have access to. But I'm also quite interested in very quickly getting your comment on the potential availability of this data. To me, most of these sources are very rich in terms of what they can say in, with regards to how do we ensure the teaching and learning quality. Um, but for a typical teacher, uh, do you think that anyone who is interested in working uh, and, and potentially developing a solution to some of the challenges that they are having, do they have access to all of these da data sources that you have mentioned? Uh, do you want to comment on the accessibility of this? Okay. So, so there's two issues there. So first of all, you asked me what additional data would I like to collect? Yes, that was the first part of the question. Absolutely. And then the second, what is the, um, do they have access to, to all of this? So the extra, the, the extra data, additional sources that we need to collect to potentially solve some of these challenges in ensuring teaching and learning quality is children's readiness to learn and their emotional well-being. So that could be, you know, what's the student's ability to self-regulate and to interact? Do they know what it is? And teachers, are teachers clear about it? What mm. it is? Mm. Um, what's the quality of the lesson design like with the support? You know, how is that support used? So if you've got teaching assistants or you've got different groupings or support staff, how is the quality of that lesson design being supported by that mm. by the extra um, groupings or support or whatever the teacher is putting into place what's the balance of teacher talk to student talk like you need mm. you know these are things that we that help us in talking about the quality of teaching and learning and then the contextualized factors that help students to interact in the lessons as i said the mm. manipulative the resources the groupings and then again parental support are you know when they go home are they with when parents are supporting learning and that's obviously now it's even more relevant with parents doing some of the you know doing the teaching is you know how what's the engagement like both ways from teacher to parent and parent to teacher mm -hmm. now in terms of teachers and how much support you know how much access do they have to um this data they have quite a lot in terms of surveys mm -hmm. um, that they will conduct but it's whether they have the time to really reflect on that survey, yeah. those surveys. And what tends to happen is it's the leadership, it's the level of leadership that will pick out what to do and what to see. Because teachers in their classrooms on a daily basis, designing and doing some of the iterative tasks like feedback and assessment, have very little time to really reflect 
mm. on some of the data to sort solve the challenges because they're planning the next day, marking, dealing mm. with parental requests. So although there's a rich data set there, it tends to be the school leaders in the school that have the most focus on it. Mm. And where the teachers might have the focus is when they do their pupil progress meeting, but then they're looking at a very limited set of data. They're not often bringing in those parental um, mm. surveys or looking at um, perhaps thinking about the support, you know, the grouping dynamics, how does that work? That mm. tends to be done more at the leadership level in all honesty. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting and, and I find it fascinating really because most of the factors that you have just mentioned in terms of some of the uh, readily available sources of data but also particularly the ones that you would like to collect data from um, are actually on those constructs that um, from the learning sciences literature we would consider and the, 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 the research would consider as very significant factors on achieving um, uh, uh, and ensuring a high quality teaching and learning in an educational organization. So there's this really well alignment there in terms of um, what you want to uh, collect data from and what the research would uh, suggest um, as educator to collect data from. And actually these days, uh, with the help of uh, new AI uh, solutions, we can collect quite complex and detailed temporal data, like time specific data about the learners and educators to interpret some of these constructs that you just mentioned as significant. I mean, for instance, in our previous work, we have been using AI techniques to, to process video data to be able to uh, generate insights into the learners' interactions in a collaborative learning environment. We were trying to look at their postures and their contributions. We were looking at the amount of speaking that is happening in the groups, amount of listening, watching, and how do these behaviors change in different groups and what's the impact of this on the learning outcomes. Um, we were in a different project looking at the uh, tutors' uh, behavior sequences uh, like, uh, uh, in a row to be able to identify any potential patterns that might represent effective uh, tutoring and teaching behaviors. And more specifically, also looking at the kind of questioning techniques of teachers uh, that, that you mentioned. And you um, see, that, that Mitlo, is gold dust for teachers. If, <laughs> if we have that in our hands and we give teachers, as leaders, if we give teachers time to reflect, on that information, that is absolute gold dust and can close mm. the gap and improve the quality of teaching and learning. But mm. I think there are two issues. I think, I think many teachers aren't aware that AI has the ability to do that mm. or how to go about you know, accessing it. That's why the framework is so useful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there is a, an existing gap between uh, the, the, what is happening in the research space and what teachers are aware of. And we really hope that these kind of discussions and webinars can open up the future opportunities as well. And kind of following up on that, I would like to kind of um, get your um, opinion on some of the particular uh, types of data that we have been collecting in our AI uh, solutions and uh, get your perspective as an educator on these because we find uh, them um, uh, challenging in terms of some of the practicalities and ethical considerations. For instance, in some of the AI work that we have been uh, doing, we were processing audio data to be able to interpret uh, learners' emotional states or teachers' emotional states to be able to potentially predict certain uh, expected learning outcomes. And AI has a lot to offer there, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, in terms of the performance and in terms of the uh, prediction accuracy, uh, there are many solutions uh, that are available uh, 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 and can be further developed. But thinking about the potential practicalities and realities of educational world and the educational world of teachers uh, and thinking about your own experience, what challenges do you come across or do you envisage that uh, we could come across if we are to move towards collating and using those relatively less traditional AI, uh, data sources uh, for our AI solutions in educational um, organizations? Do you envisage any problems there or do you think that it's perfectly fine? What's your thinking on that? Okay, uh, there are problems. There's no point in denying that. <laughs> we to get in the way of ourselves. I think the biggest problem, and I'll talk from myself as a head teacher, you know, I was a head teacher for more than 20 years and I've worked across the piece. 
One of the big problems when I was searching for answers to improve the quality of teaching and learning in the school I worked at was asking the right question. I thought I had asked the right question. I had a set of data sources that I could, you know, could really look into. But the trouble is they were all giving me different answers to the question I was trying to solve. So clearly I wasn't being specific enough about the question that myself and my leadership team were asking. And I think having done inspection work as well, that comes across very clearly in reports that I read, that we need to ask the question more specifically and to get better at doing that. That's probably one of the biggest problems because we've got masses of data sources, we throw everything at it and what we get is four different answers to the same question and then we sort of end up using our instinct, not necessarily mm. being really forensic about what mm. we want to know and what it's showing us. Mm. I can talk from my, my role um, working in schools as well that we have to have leaders that are willing to prioritise inquiry problem based approach and mm -hmm. give it the time to, to collaborate, refine and reflect on the data that we see. Because what happens is we're expected to write strategic plans and we end up jumping from one thing to another, depending on what outside agencies often pick on. Mm -hmm. teachers mindsets need to understand not see this as more work but they need to understand that this could be time saving because what mm -hmm. happens is they're often in pupil progress meetings it takes hours to analyze by hand the data mm -hmm. even if you've got it on ml ASC systems they're still going through there's a lot of um physical work there to draw their conclusions there's a nervousness to present them in case that data isn't showing you've worked really hard and it's not showing the impact that you want mm -hmm. and so you feel more vulnerable mm -hmm. also if we're going to use data from students depending on the age of those students um, we need either the child's consent or the parents consent and them understanding what we're trying to do with it and perhaps taking part in that i think sometimes we don't don't use people voice enough Mm -hmm. There's also agents agreement from other agencies, and that's a really hard one. Sometimes when we're looking at some of this data, there's medical evidence, there's evidence from agencies like social services, send police, you know, if a child's looked after, for example, social services, but that sharing practice between agencies doesn't happen. And that data and that knowledge could be so useful in improving um, the quality of teaching and learning and our readiness to learn and the approaches to well-being because you can't get anywhere unless we've got that engagement from the child and their emotional well-being sorted out. Mm -hmm. um, I think also there needs to be reassurance for people about where that data is going to be stored mm -hmm. and, and the impacts on what will happen to it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And in some um, instances, you know, what people worry about, particularly teachers, is, you know, if you're going to give us technology to help us to um, perhaps analyze some of the questions so we get the right question and there's some technology that we could utilize like the sorts of technology that you spoke about mm -hmm. um, is it going to work appropriately because so often in schools the infrastructure doesn't support the new technology mm -hmm. that they have and then it just takes more time and people lose interest mm -hmm. and then there's a final element that we must never miss there's parents mindset if we're looking at particular data we have to bring parents in and they may see it as intrusive for for example, if you're collecting data on emotional well-being or medical, um, you know, being measured through levels of stress, you know, how their children's stress levels are wearable, using wearable technology, they there might be a nervousness in all of this. So there are a number of huge challenges that we have, but they are just challenges. They're not complete barriers to anything we want to do. There'll always be challenges in anything new in education because education gets in the way of itself often. But the most important thing is if we could start to learn to ask the right question mm. and and not look at and, and be clear about which data sources will be more supportive, we'll see more impact. And then some of these mindsets will be changed far more easily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you have just mentioned quite a few number of challenges, but um, uh, you have also actually um, kind of uh, 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 essentially uh, provided some way of uh, taking steps towards the solutions of, of these challenges. Um, in our experience, um, this whole idea of potentially helping a teacher to get into this mindset that the, there is data available to them that could help them solve some of the key challenges that they are having in their everyday practice and essentially that could help them to save time on completing the tasks that they are uh, uh, 
competing in their schools is a, a massive barrier at the moment. Uh, this initial step of letting people see the potential of the data on which they are operating or they are generating is one of the key um, uh, aims that we are trying to achieve with the uh, ethical AI framework and the, the weapons that we are um, uh, undertaking. So I would like to check with Roland if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, uh, and if not, we can continue um, going yeah, back and forward with some of these uh, some of these uh, issues and, and uh, rely upon the experience. Roland, is there any? Yeah, there, there's quite a few actually. I think there's about seven or eight now. Uh, you might have covered um, a couple of the answers. Um, so uh, I think um, if we, yeah, so if we just go to the top, um, Ian has asked, uh, just in terms of data, uh, what, what packages are best uh, to use for data collection? Uh, Azure, Python, Amazon, SQL, in your experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting because uh, almost every uh, example that you have just given uh, are dealing with the different parts of the um, uh, AI solutions. Um, uh, and the answer to this usually, is, in my opinion, is to have a, as broad uh, as possible as a toolbox of solutions and start thinking about um, the problem at hand and what the tools and packages that you have are providing to you. Now, I can tell you my uh, preference on this, but these are not correct answers. And I want to make it very clear that this is not the only uh, tool that you can use. Yeah. For language, for instance, I prefer Python because it, I'm used to using it. And it is uh, probably in terms of the um, applicability in a broad range, uh, the, the vastly uh, the most widely used uh, language. In terms of database, I usually use the SQL databases, but these are all dependent upon the school that you are working with, their IT services, the organization, um, uh, the IT people of the organization, what they are used to. Uh, in my opinion, uh, thinking about what languages or what databases, what um, tools that I should learn um, or what packages I should learn is not really the uh, right uh, start point. Uh, I think the, the right start point is to think about, uh, okay, among all of these uh, options, what do they offer and what is my particular problem that I would like to solve and choose uh, from this toolbox, uh, which, whichever is appropriate. These days um, in uh, open source libraries, there are so many beautifully written, freely available, uh, uh, packages that you can use very interesting things, including all of these uh, uh, gesture analysis that we have done, audio analysis that we have done. Most of these are research tools that are available, written in uh, uh, different languages uh, and, and can be used by educators for free. Cool. Nice. Um, very robust answer. <laughs> um, so uh, Stefania has asked um, which data type, uh, I think this, you're probably going to give a similar answer for this, which data type would be best appropriate or most appropriate for assessing students and, uh, and, and also knowing uh, where they, uh, indicating where they would need more help um, and, and will gamification be an answer uh, to, for this at all? Hmm. That's an interesting question really. Um... I know I will sound too academic again, like <laughs> the previous answer, but I think it, it really depends on the expected learning outcomes that you are trying to achieve. Um, for instance, thinking about uh, group interactions that Karin just mentioned as a very significant and important um, uh, data source potentially um, uh, in our educational um, um, organizations. Now, in the group interactions, you might be interested in increasing um, individual students' knowledge, content acquisition, so collaborative learning, and for which you might give them um, tools that would measure their uh, knowledge of the content that they are working on, the subject that they are working on. And for this, it might be more appropriate to implement more traditional um, um, uh, data collection tools like exams, surveys, these kind of uh, uh, straightforward data collection tools. 
Whereas, if you are interested in the process of collaboration, if you are interested in the process of how do groups actually work and how do individual students interact while they are collaborating, giving them a survey would be a too far off a proxy to interpret the process of collaboration. Then you would need a, a, a lot more uh, temporal uh, data source like the videos or a lot more temporal data source like audios or the content of the discussions. You would need different sources of data depending on the learning outcome, the educational outcome that you are trying to achieve. Um, starting from the outcome that you would like to achieve, you should drive to the type of sources, uh, the data types that would benefit you the most and would be the most closest uh, proxies for the constructs that we are interested in, essentially. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this, I think you, you might have already covered this, um, but um, just uh, asking about the uh, consent, um, mm -hmm. the, the idea that um, children uh, don't have, um, you know, sort of the, the ability to uh, make decisions about what they're exposed to and, and things like that. Mm. Um, we assume that consent is provided by the parents if you're if you're requiring children to be mm. interacting with particular technology or surveys. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's both really. We uh, in, in in ethical uh, uh, research, we collect consent form from the parents uh, uh, as the guardians of the children, but we also collect assent forms from the children, saying that they're essentially happy uh, for this to happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think consent is a very important topic uh, to be discussed, particularly when we are thinking about the uh, uh, multimodal data sources, because it is important for people, for children, for teachers uh, who are providing this data to know what exactly they are uh, consenting to. Um, and this requires some level of understanding and clear definitions of uh, from the data collector's point of view, data identifiers and data uh, collating point of view, uh, clear uh, definitions of uh, uh, what each data source uh, uh, are doing and how they will be used. And they, these should be shared both with the teachers and uh, the parents, as well as the as part of the ascent form with children, uh, because at the end of the day, um, data should be owned by the people who generate this, um, rather than um, uh, any 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 particular organization. I'm sure Karin might have uh, some opinion on this, coming from more practical. Um, uh, uh, and, and practitioner point of view, but from a research uh, point of view, uh, both consent forms and from the guardians and the assent forms from the uh, 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 children should be collected uh, and we should make sure that everybody is aware of what data is being collected from them and how it will be used. Um, I, I would agree totally with that. And, and one of the things that's important, obviously the younger the children, the, the harder it is when you're talking to them you know, to explain what you're collecting data for. So both is really useful. That doesn't negate the fact that you should still talk to the children because it's a bit like in the future, that data is gonna follow that child wherever they are. And so mm -hmm. um, building up, if you like, a historical model of where they have had that, it's, it, they're used to having being explained to why they're collecting data and they and their parents um, can then discuss that at home. Obviously as they get older and, and students become into the, the sort of teenagers and adults years, it's still important, but they, but but they'll want more of their, you know, there'll be a higher value in terms of them consenting themselves. Mm. But very young students, yes, and I think you have to. It's something we've got to start building in more and more, talking to the students and not just assuming that because they're young they can't have that conversation with mm. you if they're a mm. 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 Absolutely, and I think um, just engaging uh, with the. Um, teachers, with uh, parents, with children, as part of these uh, data relevant issues, with regards to these data relevant issues, uh, itself can be quite informative uh, to create a shared understanding um, among the people who will be using this data and uh, uh, people who are providing this data. Um, to me, consent forms are a lot more than a guideline and tick box exercises of 
people are just quickly going through. You don't really know if they are actually reading or understanding particularly um, and, and just ticking the box that they are happy for the data to be collected. I think consent is a, a lot broader discussion uh, 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 and allowing opportunities, more opportunities for uh, uh, everyone, including the children, to be part of these discussions with regards to what type of data they are generating and what is the value of it and how it could be used um, uh, is itself very informative uh, uh, as well. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, uh, one for um, just on um, a sort of uh, schools and, and councils, uh, somebody's asked uh, what about schools that are maintained where councils have. Uh, you know, ha have a say in, in the way that uh, sort of data is, is uh, collected or what data is collected. Uh, and they might not have the information to, to make the, the right decisions or any decisions. Um, you know, how, how, does, uh, how do you work that relationship? Okay, so there are two issues. I, I was in a maintained school myself and I um, worked as a strategic lead for an authority where I was allowing for consent as well. So. The reality is every school in different districts, whatever designation they are, are going to come across a set of different difficulties and challenges. The, what you need to do is um, talk to your council, explain what you're trying to do on the key person in it, and again, have an open conversation. For me, that's the way I got round. And it's not always easy. I'm not going to tell you it's easy. I had some uh, interesting data chats with um, very pedantic views about people who, who couldn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. But again, you have to open that conversation. You have to discuss why you want to do what you do and then build a network of people who are looking at it so that you can have some reasoned arguments because these things are sensitive and um, county councils will be worried about agreeing and consenting to releasing certain forms of data because obviously with everything, you know, we're in a, a, a litigation mode in many people are worried about litigation um, and they're worried about the sensitivities of letting things go. So you have to be really, and again, it's being really clear about why you want the data, what the purpose is for and what the impact will be. If you can give a reasoned argument, more people are willing to listen. And if there's more than one of you that are trying to do that because you have um, something that you're trying to develop, then actually that's how things move forward. But yes, that is a challenge. But again, it is about opening that conversation. I, I wonder if um, this next question is, is somewhat um, related to that as well, actually, because um, Rohit's asked um, uh, regarding a sort of uh, hypothesis um, space, um, the, the method uh, of analyzing data is, is entwined, uh, intertwined with uh, equally with models and theories um, and schools generally have their own established pedagogical models. So in, in both of your experiences, how does one find sort of common ground or, or what's, what's, what's the most important thing in, in, in sort of establishing a common ground in terms of you're talking about what you're doing with what you want to achieve with data and models and theories and the reality of actually working with, with a school with their, its own sort of learning models. Okay, there isn't one school across the country that's going to be the same in terms of the way they approach or all the teachers that are teaching in it. And, you know, so there's a whole set of values there. What's most important is what is the question you're trying to answer to improve the quality of teaching and learning in your school and then finding the right tools to do that analysis. The pedagogic, pedagogical approaches are different and they can only be discussed through open conversation, joining, um, joining networks, discussing and being willing to actually reflect on your approach, to be actually, you know, to have a challenge and then to reflect on, okay, so this is what I'm trying to do. Is the approach that I'm using the right one? Okay, and that will come from answering the questions that you want to, that you've, you've, you've that have been posed. Um, and that's how in terms of, in my school, when we were trying, you know, and we didn't always get it right. I'm not sitting here saying to you that because I told you I had lots of data and sometimes that data was conflicting, but what, what it did for us is made us look at our approaches and reflect and try and refine on, on those. And, and actually look to others as well to see what they were doing. So, you know, who, who are telling me that they've, they've closed the gap or showcasing the impact of what they've done. So that's, that's what happens when you have a question that you want to answer. You've got a particular pedagogical approach. You've got a data set that you're looking at. Perhaps you're not solving that. You will look at how you're approaching it and then perhaps open, open um, up the issue 
to looking at different methods and approaches. I hope that, that was clear in, in, in from whomever <laughs> answered that question. Answered that question. Yes. Uh, sorry, I think Mulu is just sharing his screen again there. Um, okay. So um, thank you very much for being. Um, so Paul has uh, asked, um, uh, while the ethical implications and, concerned, uh, and concerns about bias in AI are, um, are sort of rampant in, in news uh, in general, um, using AI on, on primary school kids should only be allowed under strict supervision and, and accountability. So I, su I suppose the, the question in that is, um, you know, do you agree and is there going to be a point um, when, you know, when children are going to be able to be using these programs without supervision and should that, you know, should that ever be a case? May I take this, Carrie? Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, I think that's an excellent question, uh, to be fair. And I do agree with the fact that we have to be extremely cautious in terms of the AI solutions that we are implementing in our educational organizations, particularly when we're talking about relatively younger children. But usually, the, to me, the solution, uh, any kind of solution to these kind of ethical considerations, I don't really think that there can be one particular specific solution, but any kind of shared agreement can only be achieved if we as researchers, as teachers, as, as, as children themselves, being part of these discussions in terms of the what can be done with these technologies, what kind of data we can collect and how this data can be processed and showing the implications of these through discussions with these people from which we are collecting the data. Uh, if we are not talking about this now, uh, when is the time and who will be talking about this? Uh, there is no implication in my opinion, and there shouldn't be any implication that any of these AI solutions that we have just mentioned as examples will be straightforward and directly implemented in any of the education organizations. But these are the opportunities that we have and everybody should be aware of the opportunities that we have and they should decide if these opportunities are aligned with their values. Um, and that kind of relates to the previous question as well. And um, uh, uh, as part of this uh, ethical AI framework that what we are trying to achieve is to create these kind of discussions and kind of participatory progress uh, with the uh, teachers and educators and, and, and hopefully potential teachers as well. So even for at the stage of thinking about what data we would like to collate, uh, the discussion should be in a participatory manner, uh, bringing in the values and the opinion of the people from which we are collecting the data. Um, so that's an excellent question. And uh, obviously uh, schools who are implementing this without appropriate value alignment should be accounted for uh, 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 the, the actions. Uh, but if we are not talking about this and not making everyone aware of the potential of these technologies, um, then we will not be able to harness anything. I just muted myself, sorry. Uh, we, we've only got one minute left, um, unfortunately, uh, Karim and, and everybody here. So um, I thought, unless you wanted to continue answering questions, do you? No. I, I think the, the time is uh, of, of the essence with your schedules. Uh, so do you, are you okay to stay on, Mutlu? Uh, I just wanted to quickly uh, mention about uh, next week's um, uh, webinar. <laughs> um, and uh, I would be very happy to talk about um, any of these issues. And this is the main reason why we are doing this, these webinars to um, open up opportunities for discussion. So anyway, uh, if you have any questions about any of these issues that we have just discussed, or you want to be part of it, you want to engage, please drop your, an email to help at educateventures.com. Uh, next week, we will continue with our ethical AI framework with the step four, uh, and we will be particularly looking at the tools that we uh, use uh, the, the, to collect data in education organizations. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone uh, who has joined and who has contributed with very interesting questions. And uh, I also particularly would like to thank Karin for her brilliant input as 
as an experienced uh, educator. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in the, in the next webinar. Thank you very much, Malik. Thank you very much, Karim. Uh, thanks to everybody that attended. Um, and uh, yes, we will be holding uh, our next webinar, uh, as they say, on uh, Thursday, the 18th of June. And that is a, the AI readiness webinar for uh, businesses, educational businesses. Uh, and that will be at 4 p.m. Uh, British summer time. Uh, hope to see you there. Please follow along uh, the uh, organizer profile in Eventbrite that I've linked to in the chat there. Uh, you'll see all the new um, uh, webinars that we're hosting. Uh, so I'm going to close the room and thank you very much to everybody that came along and take care, stay safe. Goodbye. Bye.